Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind-the-scenes videos and two-minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. We are giving you something special. Going to talk really quickly about the documentary Roadrunner, which uh, our friend of the show, Morgan Neville, directed. We had him on a few years ago for the documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? He also uh, directed a film that I loved that came out, I don't know, 2011, 2012, 13, something around there called 20 Feet from Stardom. You can find that on Netflix. Love that movie too. Mm -hmm. Um, And Morgan, side note, uh, lived in the city for a minute uh, in the Mission District. I think you can, I think we talked about that in our interview. Anyways, he directed Roadrunner, which is a documentary about um, the beloved Anthony Bourdain, who we loved. And we wanted to package our special Bourdain crawl that we did in the summer of 2018, summer, fall. And so we're leading you into this, but we can talk about Roadrunner for a minute. Um, Do you want to start because... (laughs) Throwing well, you under the bus, Ange. Why? Because you need a second to cry. Yeah, I'm just going to cry it out. It's fine. I it, I was really excited to watch this documentary, but I was also dreading it because I haven't really been able to watch his shows since he passed. I think I just spit out water. Yes, you did. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I saw it. And <laughs> so I was dreading it, but I was also really excited. And it really was just so much more than I could have expected. Uh, I loved seeing... A young Anthony Bourdain. I'll say Uh, young in quotation marks because he was still, you know, he was in his 40s when he, you know, finally made it, you know, with uh, I know confidential. Yes. But just seeing him as a young chef, just having a cigarette in the alley or, you know, really cool old photos of him um, at these like prestigious restaurants in New York that he was working at. But so that part was cool. And then just the transition of his life and kind of getting into um, where his head was and yeah. where all the confusion lied and all of his friends, including David Chang and David Cho, who are huge LA icons in the, in the food world and in the art world. I love them both. And they played a major role in this film. And I didn't realize how close they were to him. Like they really yeah. were his confidants, you know, yeah. not, not just food wise, but life wise. So really pulled it all of the emotional strings, but um Yeah, just all the information you ever wanted to know about him, I think, is in this film. And there's so many little surprises. I won't spoil them all. But yeah, like to Angie's point, he was 43 when Kitchen Confidential came out and he hit it. I'm like, oh, there's hope. (laughs) (laughs) All right. This is not about you. This is not about 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 me, but it it was the like, you know. I thought that too, though. I was like, oh, see? (laughs) Yeah, see? We still got it. There's flavor. (laughs) <laughs> in our old asses but uh, yeah 43 and like he never traveled mm-hmm. before that book came mm-hmm. out which blew my mind too um there's just so many poignant moments and i'll start crying if we talk about it so do you want to take it <laughs> for a minute sorry well, Char. <laughs> and and you know the the time leading up to when he passed they really dive into that and i wasn't sure how deep they were going to go or, you know, it's pretty, Mm. it's pretty direct. um, The point that they're trying to make about the details of his passing and and maybe speculating as to why this happened. They, they, they went there and I wasn't, I was surprised about that too. So um, yeah, be ready, (laughs) be ready when you watch it to. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of factors. It's not just one factor. Mm -hmm. Um. It was a couple of years leading up to his passing too. It wasn't just overnight, which was interesting because, you know, side note, not that Ange and I know Anthony Bourdain whatsoever, but we were lucky enough to meet him in, in 2018. Well, when did the book come out? No, he died in 2018. No, no, no. 2017, I think, or 17. Oh, yeah, I think 16. When Appetites came out. Yeah. And, um, 
we met him and he was he was fine and super nice, but there was just um, not a lot of energy. He was real tired. Like. And that's what he told me, because I was trying to go to the bar with him. I know. <laughs> and just trying to recruit him. <laughs> and he's like, you I'm know. tired. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So kind of not 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 totally surprising. Um, and especially, I think, to well, I don't know. Watch the film. Anyways, Roadrunner comes out July 16th. Um, but listen to our, our Bourdain crawl, which we did in 18. Oh my God. And we have a lot of, a lot of gems, a lot of gems. Yeah. This was so much fun. It was actually spread out. Uh, it was a three day event for us spread out, um, you know, within a week or something that we did it and we hit up not obviously not all of his favorite spots because that would be impossible, but some of our favorites that were also his favorites and, and Yeah. We start off real professional. We get a little sloppy. I'll just say that. <laughs> Look, if you're honoring Bourdain, you're going to get a little sloppy. It's yeah. not like he was a totally perfect on camera presence everywhere he went, which was exactly. why we loved him. Mm-hmm. Like it was OK to be a little sloppy and be yourself um, sometimes. So enjoy, <laughs> enjoy our uh, crawl. Um, see Roadrunner, please. Uh, and we have a little promotion going on this week too. So, uh, hop onto our socials, uh, Instagram's probably the best and maybe you can win something from us oh, that has to do with Anthony Bourdain. Uh, so thanks for listening. Go, go out and do a uh, Bourdain crawl if you're in the city, by the way, or look up your city and see where he went. Cause I'm sure he's got one for all the major cities. Um, we should actually do that. We should travel around and do Bourdain crawls. 2023 maybe that yeah. feels safe <laughs> <laughs> all right Goodbye. all right yeah yeah thanks for listening talk to you later welcome to bitch talk booze interviews straight from the heart of san francisco i'm aaron that's captain party hi it's, welcome uh, captain party number two over there char how did I become? I don't know. It just fit. Two. It just really fit. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are doing a little tribute to, uh, I'm just going to say he's a friend of the show, <laughs> Anthony Bourdain, someone that's really close to our hearts. Our hero. One right. of my favorite people. I wouldn't even say celebrity. That's not the right word for him. No. He's something more. Yeah. Iconic we'll f- figures we'll of. We'll figure it out. The saint? I don't know. <laughs> I know he wasn't a saint, but that's what makes him more saintier. That doesn't make sense. Uh, we are kind of doing our own little restaurant pub crawl. I'm in calling honor. it a Bourdain crawl. The Bourdain crawl. That's what I've been calling We're it, We're going to start marketing yeah. it, too. I mean, he'll totally be down with this. Duh. Um, but so we're starting at one of the places he loved and um, shot for no reservations, Red's Java House, which, by the way, opened in 1930 and was called Franco's Lunch at the time. Duh. And it served longshoremen. And their breakfast special was a double cheeseburger and beer. So, yes. Duh. Duh. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's a very quintessentially San Francisco thing. You mean double cheeseburger and a breakfast? A beer for breakfast. Well, yeah, the yeah. origins of San Francisco. Right. Um, Maybe not today so much with the kale influx and the techies. Yeah, but and vegans. <laughs> yeah, vegans. And anyways. Um, but yeah, that spirit has maintained since the 30s. Yeah. And this place is pretty much as uh, local and, and grimy as it gets in a good way. In a very good way. <laughs> and it has a great view. We're right. We're right under basically the Bay Bridge. It's really pretty day here. It's just really windy. We were trying to like capture the outdoor spirit of Reds and we're like, it's a little windy for us today. Which is part of the outdoor spirit, but yeah. not good for filming. Or for mice. <laughs> so, but um, what, um, oh, sorry. No, go for it. Well, what, uh, Bourdain, he was here uh, in, oh. for no reservations yeah. and he called it a wonderful old school, high fat, high protein, <laughs> beer for breakfast kind of place. And uh, that's why it was close to his heart. Yeah. And also he said for the insiders of, of the food world, it's the antidote to Alice Waters who was, is the founder of Chez Panisse, which is across the bay over in Berkeley. So you can Google that and see what that means. <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. 
he, you know, he was uh, he was kind of witty and snarky, just just the way I like it. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're gonna start here. We have a couple more places on our list today, and we're really trying to keep it classy because Char likes that. And um, classy, I didn't sign up for that. Yeah, we have to keep it above board. Today. I did not sign up for that, Char. Since when did I always say it has to be classy? Because you said it. The last time we got real excited and probably drank a little too much, you had a hard time editing it. (laughs) And it was a real long intro. (laughs) Well, well, that's different. But that was post a lot of action and excitement. This is like in the midst of the drinking and the eating. So that's going to be different, right? Yeah, no, like this is like it's meant we're we're crawling. We're doing a Bourdain crawl, you know, to honor the man, right? Yeah. He wasn't classy. Uh, that that uh <laughs> that could be sometimes. I mean, have you seen him in a tux? That intro Did we you were see him in a tux? That intro we were supposed to be uh introing a event about <laughs> death and we were <laughs> <laughs> it was late. And we were <laughs> tired and it was a long day. There was a lot of emotions that day. A we lot. Cried, we both had cried twice that day. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh by now I I'm not necessarily crying upset over Bourdain but still heartbroken uh, so and still definitely affected and um, I don't think it's hit me quite yet it's only been a week I, well that's I guess that was the first thing that I was going to say is um, when you found out how were you because I know how you usually are emotionally <laughs> oh Aaron she's speaking to Aaron for those of you that can't so see so I'm not <laughs> I don't feel good about talking about it just yet okay <laughs> okay okay what about and you? Well, well, I was a fucking mess. I got a text from our friend. I woke up at like six something oh. uh, to oh, a yeah. text that's that also, he had passed. That's also the thing, too. Our friend Annika, who's been on this show, Jeff Hunt sitting over there in the corner from Story to San Francisco. He got a text. I don't even know what time it was. And I heard his phone go off. And I'm like, who's texting you? He's like, I oh, don't know. I didn't turn my phone off. But it ended up being Annika, our roommate, who's been on the show before. She's a filmmaker. And I guess she got woken up by a text from her friend. She's like, I didn't know what to do. So I just started texting everyone. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, uh, I'm kind of glad we didn't look right at that That's, time. I, I was... Well, I was counting throughout the day the amount of people that had texted me about it. I think I reached like 12 to 14 different people that had texted me about it. I woke up, uh, yeah, so I, like, you know, like the internal clock woke me up at like five, five uh-huh. something, between five and six or something like that. I woke up and I looked at my phone and I saw the news and it's like, there was like a bunch of people that I immediately wanted to talk to about it. And you two were on top of that list to like let know. And I'm like, dude, it's five o'clock in the morning. I can't be texting all these wow. people. Annika. So, <laughs> like I, she so yeah. I, I waited a few hours and then I, then I think I waited till like, I think I got to you guys like about eight or nine and I was just like, well, at least you guys have the. No, I had been in memory, depression so. for it long before you texted. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I had to keep like my sunglasses on for a minute for the first few hours of the day. Cause I had to go out into the public and just kind of try not to think about it, you know? But then I kept getting texts about it. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to hide my phone now. Yeah, I think and you, then, you um, texted me later on and you were like, send me pictures and cheer me up. Yeah, we had just done an interview with uh, Bo Burnham, which is coming soon to you. And he was incredible. And Char didn't send me a picture of that. So I was like, send me a picture of that so I can remember that interview. That was a good time. And he was a, a real sweetheart. So I just uh, needed th- something to cheer me up. <laughs> I think it's hard, too. We live in San Francisco. And Bourdain loved San Francisco yeah. as much as we do. Um, so there's reminders every day. He did. He called, in fact, he called it a two-fisted drinking town. Dirty <laughs> and nasty and wonderful. Anyone who doesn't have a great time in SF is pretty much dead to me. <laughs> so there Ditto. you go. We are at the Tadich Grill, the original cold day restaurant. They've been here for 169 years, and we're sitting here with an old friend. I shouldn't say old, really. Yeah, less, uh, of, uh, less of the old, please, darling. Okay. Um, uh, how do I say this? A long-term friend. Thank you. A, a long-time yeah. friend. Uh, I started my career in uh, communications and TV with this man. His name is Liam Maklem. Oh my lord! Oh my way, god! He's getting. We, we interrupt this broadcast to be anointed. He's getting. He's getting bibbed as we speak. <laughs> I'm having my bib put on because at the Tadich, uh, a time-honored tradition here uh, is to come enjoy the chipino, uh, wear a bib, get messy, and 
you know, just do what they do here. Thank you, sir. It's cute. Yeah. I'm going to take a picture of you. Institution. I should be in an institution. Well, I, well, I am. This is one. This is uh, one. Erin, um, let, let me just say this yes. before you ask the questions. Yes. It's an honor. Oh. Finally, after yeah. 290 plus f- episodes, you finally got to me. Good yeah. to know where I am on the totem pole. Good um, to know uh, that you love me so much and so dearly that you've waited 280 plus uh, episodes to come see me. It's okay. I'm not bitter about it at all. But I, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this is for a special occasion. It is And indeed. I think maybe we waited the song because of this occasion. Can it, we raise a glass? Of course. To start and say slancha, which is what the Irish say. And, you know, I'm of Irish descent. So slancha to you guys. Cheers for being here today with me. Cheers. Um, I'll start this little story off and then I want you to s- tell all of your stories and really tell the audience how you knew Anthony Bourdain. But the first time I saw Anthony Bourdain was over in Oakland at the Paramount. And before I got there with a friend of mine, I saw that you were posting photos from inside the limo that you guys were riding around town. <laughs> That's right. And man, I was bitter. So yeah. let's just... <laughs> uh, yeah. Bitter on bitter here. Bitter on bitter. But um, can you talk about your relationship with Anthony and also... After that, talk yeah. about his influence on food in San Francisco and how that's come into your life. Absolutely. Well, first, uh, as you mentioned his name, I get, yeah, I'm getting a I get goosebumps. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Bourdain uh, insisted that you call him Tony uh, if you were you know, not on television or, or not broadcasting. And I first met him. Uh, well, I interviewed him uh, on Quran 4 uh, when his first book came out in 2001, I think it was, Kitchen Confidential. Uh, it was the, thank you, oh, the calamari just arrived, folks. Yeah. Look at that, they taste Perfect. so good. Yeah. Anthony Bourdain hadn't done much television. In fact, his interview on Crown With Me was his second ever live interview wow. uh, on television. He was very wow. nervous and uh, apprehensive, uh, but he knew he had a good book. Uh, and at first, when I first met him, I wasn't sure if I was gonna like him. He seemed a little full of himself. Uh, He's a little gruff. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then very quickly, uh, I saw the humanity in him when he said, I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous about this. And he went from being tall, intimidating, uh, you know, that hard sort of rough around the edges New Yorker, uh, quickly evaporated. And I saw, uh, I saw the kindness in him pretty quickly. Uh it's tough to talk about him because it's hard to believe that he's gone. Yeah. So um, when he came to San Francisco, he always uh, I always made a point of seeking him out. He wasn't calling me saying, hey, Liam, I'm coming to San Francisco <laughs> tomorrow. But we had a mutual friend. We have a mutual friend, Chef Roland yeah. Perceau, mm-hmm. uh who owns La Folie and Left Bank uh, mm-hmm. Brasseries. And he adored Roland. And so every time uh, Tony came to town, uh, we would always meet up. We would have drinks. I'd go wherever he was. He asked me to introduce him on stage at the Fox Theater in Oakland for his first tour. Uh, and his, again, uh, I saw a very sweet side to Tony Bourdain that day. He was pacing up and down backstage. He seemed a little nervous. Wickedly nervous. Yeah. And I said, Tony, stop pacing. He goes, I- I've got to, I've got to. It's the only way I can get through this. I said, well... Do me a favor and have a beer with me, will you? I said, because you're making me nervous. He goes, I, I can't drink right before this. We'll, we'll drink after. I said, I'm having a beer. So as he heard the sound of pssst, the can opening, he said, okay, give me one. So we had a beer <laughs> together backstage, uh, and he stopped pacing. Uh, and we just had a good, a good you know, conversation. And uh, he just had his first daughter at that point. Uh, I think she was maybe one year, one or two years old. She was young. And he was excited about being a new dad. He'd just given up smoking as well. That's the, wow. the reason, therefore, for his, um, his pacing up and down. Uh, but to answer your question, Aaron, you asked about... Um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was long. Yeah. Um, just, uh, you're a foodie guy. You, you yeah. do a show called Foodie Chap yeah. on KCBS. Yeah, I'm definitely more of a chap than a guy. Well, but Foodie Chap. And yeah. um, you talk about food all the time. Tony talked about food all the time, especially in San Francisco. Yeah. What was his influence on how you view food in San Francisco or vice versa? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, he had a huge influence on me uh, as a broadcaster uh, and someone who for the last 15 years of my life, I focused on food and uh, wine, travel. Uh, he had the gig I wanted. Right. And yeah. I was doing similar things on a local level. 
what I loved about Tony Bourdain, Anthony Bourdain, was that he he broke the wall. Uh, he rewrote the the TV manual for the TV host. None of his shows began with him saying, hello, good evening, tonight on the show, all the things I did, he wasn't doing uh, because he tore up the playbook. There was no playbook for him, no manual for him. It was him being real, raw, authentic, interacting with people, sharing his passion for food, for culture, uh, and for bringing that to the world. He traveled the world, going to places that many people were too afraid to venture to, uh, be it the Congo. Right, uh, I love it, that episode. Mm-hmm. Be it Iran. Uh, he showed the underbelly of every place he visited. He tasted the food no one else dared to. He gave a voice and shone a light on the underdogs, the underserved. And um, So having met him basically in the beginning of his career as we knew it, did you, and, 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 and being friends with him throughout, did you feel the effects that fame and, and his celebrity had on him and, and was taking a toll on him? You know, here's the deal. Um, he could be a, a, a bit of a prickly character, uh, but he was always gracious with people he interacted with. Uh, I was at his side for his book signing when he was last uh, in yeah. San Francisco yeah. uh, a year and a half ago. At the Tonga Room. The we Tonga saw you room. there. You were there. That's when That's I right. met him the That's only right. time. Absolutely. I tried to get him to go to the bar with me, but it didn't yeah. work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I have to say, um, I saw him once more after that, but I remember on that occasion thinking... My, look what's here. It's the Japino. It's the Japino. My friend, tell me, tell me what's in the Japino. Uh, it's a seafood stew, tomato base with garlic. We got a lot of uh, crab meat, shrimp meat, uh, halibut, uh, mussels, clams, prawns, scallops, mm. you name it. Well, listen, this is the perfect, perfect dish to have any day, San Francisco, but especially on those foggy days, you want to warm your tummy. Uh, warm your soul. This is the dish to have. It smells heavenly. It looks good enough to eat. Yeah. With, <laughs> <laughs> with some garlic bread. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. A little uh, no, Chipino okay. interruption. Th- no, it's okay. It's okay fine. when you get interrupted by Chipino. Yeah. Uh, so. Tonga Room. Tonga Room. I remember Tony. Uh, I think fine, they, yeah. they may dip some bread and, yeah, they're, and welcome. I'm absolutely welcome to. Uh, I remember thinking when I saw him. Uh, I knew that uh, the last couple of years, Tony had been, uh, Anthony Bourdain had been doing judo, uh, and he just got his black belt certification. He was pretty proud about that, but he looked tired. And my first mm-hmm. thing I said to him was, how you doing? Really, how you doing? And uh, he said, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm really freaking tired. And I could see it, could see it in his eyes. And uh, I... I just saw a different side of him. He can often be reserved. He can often pull back a little bit. He can often come across as a little chilly to people. But he had a big heart. I mean, in terms of uh, you know, the, 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 the time he gave people who would otherwise not have, not have champions. In terms of you know, kitchen workers, he mm-hmm. was a fighter for uh, equal pay, uh, the Me Too movement. I mean, he was always thinking about uh, the underserved, the underdogs. Uh, but on that last occasion, he was he was tired. Usually, we would have a drink after an event right, like that. Yeah. And I said, "Hey, do you want to come with me in Roland? Let's go. Let's go and have a couple of pops." He said, "He said, you know, I usually would." He said, "I just I, I just want to go to my room." I said, "No worries, no worries." Um, but I could tell that uh, he said the schedule was brutal. Um, he said, "I'm really proud of what we're doing right now." He goes, "But it's it, it's killing me," you know, in a sort of Right. Yeah. Uh, as you would say, yeah. I would say things like that sometimes when I travel a lot. I'm like, ah, oh, schedule's brutal, but I'm loving what I'm doing. He loved what he did. Uh, he loved meeting new people. He loved going to new cities. He loved revisiting cities he'd been to before. Exactly. San Francisco and finding, is one of them. Oh, yeah, and telling yeah. a different story. Right. And every time he came to a different city, if he returned, he always found something new to share, yes. something new to report on. Uh, but. You know, is a guy who shared his passion uh, with the world. Right. We're going to let you eat your chipino. Oh, really? The famous Tadich grilled I get to, chipino. I get to eat. But I want to thank you for your time and for yeah. your stories. It's really special. No, of And course. I know you were you were a real connector to Tony, I think, at least in my world. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, well, Liam knows him, so he's yeah. totally cool. No, um, well, and if I can say one more, yeah. one, one more thing about him. Um, a lot of Americans... Uh, 
uh, by the way, his show is broadcast all over the world. But I think he inspired people to travel, mm-hmm. inspired people to get passports who would otherwise perhaps not. Uh, he inspired people, you know, to venture uh, beyond their comfort zone. Uh, and I know that when many of my friends traveled, me too, you know, when I went to Taiwan, I sought out the things that he sought out. I remember going back to Hawaii after his first show from Oahu, and I went down that alley looking for that little late night dive where all the chefs go. Uh, and then here in San Francisco, you know, the places I've loved for years, he loved too. So you at Lee, you know, yeah. late night eats, great mm-hmm. Chinese cuisine on the edge of Chinatown on Broadway, um, the Tadich. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he was also a fan of Swan Oysters. He went there yep. a couple times with Roland. Uh, thank you, Tony Bourdain, for the gift of you and for sharing your love and your passion um, for food and culture. Yeah. Thank you, Liam. Hello guys, welcome to our third location for the Bourdain Crawl. We are at the official Buddha Bar in Chinatown, the one and only Chinatown San Francisco. What I love about our crawl so far, Aaron, maybe you can agree with me, is yes. uh, we started off uh, at the pier, uh, which catered to the, the shipyards, the sailors that came into Long the bay. Shoreman, yep. our, our second stop was at Tadich Grill, which really catered to the 1850s gold rush. Yes. Um, and, and we didn't really get to talk about that, but there was a, a hash, a Hangtown Fry, oh, yeah, which Hangtown is an fry. omelet, the, yes. the bacon and oyster omelet that, that Bourdain loved at Tadich Grill. Yeah. And that said helped. it should be illegal. Absolutely. With a martini for yeah. breakfast. And um, that really fed... Uh, the, the whole Gold Rush crowd. Uh, so we went from the Longshoremen to the Gold Rush, and now we're in Chinatown, which in San Francisco, uh, the, they, they really helped shape the city and turn it into what it is today and continue to be a huge effect on the city in a beautiful way. Yeah. So I, um, I love how well-rounded we've been so far. I'm kind of proud of us. Well, I mean, we have to be really proud of Anthony Bourdain. I mean, bring yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm proud of us. He's really, he's really he's the one guiding. that brought us out here. And he's guiding the tour. He, he's with us. Yeah. For sure, yeah. and um, Liam was incredible. I want to thank again Liam uh, thank you for that sharing his whole story. conversation. We were kind of just sitting and listening. It was yeah. really story time. Yep, there, there was that was that was his his part of the, the show. But right. yeah, now we're at the Buddha Bar, which uh, Bourdain had a had a good time here. Uh, a big part of this bar is it's very hole in the wall. Uh, oh, you, yeah. you sit at the bar, you play liars dice, you bet your drink. You, you bet against the bartender for your, for the price of your drink. Right. And it's just a down and dirty hole in the wall. Yeah. Just like us. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Not a hole in the wall, but down and dirty hole. We can end it there. Shar, any last words? When was the last time you were at Buddha Lounge, by the way? Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, maybe. All right. And it was, uh, I think it was after a Cinco de Mayo fest. <laughs> and you know what's weird is a lot of my memories at, like, this place, uh, Buddha, uh, Lipo across the street, uh, it always was, like, after, like, some kind of random, like, radio event where it's, and it was, like, Cinco de Mayo or, um, uh, oh, we were at the Tonga Room. The last time I was at the, uh, the Lipo Lounge, uh, we were at... Uh, we threw a number one party at the Tonga Room, oh. and then we bar crawled to <laughs> Leap Lounge. Oh God! And then we had hotels at the Fairmont, and we oh, went you're back lucky. to the Fairmont. Okay. Fairmont. But um, Leap Lounge, I also have a good memory from Leap Lounge of um, DJ with no name, no yeah. name. Um, he threw a uh, a fiftieth birthday party for Glenn Danzig. So for who? Glenn Danzig. Oh, yes. Wait, was he still at that other radio station you yeah. were at then? I and, remember this. And we started at the gates of Chinatown, and we uh, told everybody that wanted to go there that we were going to do a... Um, we we're gonna have a party in the basement down there. Yeah, I've been down there once. Yeah, it's hot as hell. We walked <laughs> from the gates of the Chinatown all the way down here to the Lipo Lounge took over that downstairs place and there were like three or four Danzig cover bands <laughs> and it was hot as hell and then Mike's band no oh, yeah. band The Flames yes and there 
they were blowing flames with lighters in that downstairs. Down, I thought uh, we could have died. How is that place not blown up? Dude, that I have night? a picture. I, there's a picture that I have of uh, Richie Flame blowing a fireball, and there's somebody standing in the front with a <gasps> fireball in their face. <laughs> and if you've what? ever been, we could do flames. I should do some fire dancing down there. Probably not. You shouldn't. Once you have I, you been no. down there? Yeah. Yeah. No. But I didn't know that. Fire has happened. We probably shouldn't have been doing that. <laughs> no, you probably shouldn't have. So, but anyways, Fine. just I, it's just the memories that come up around here are just awesome, and everybody, and it's like everybody relates, and everybody has a memory from all the places that we went to. If you're from San Francisco or you worked in San Francisco or whatever, you've got memories like that in a lot of these haunts that we just went to. So, a, f- a flame thrown in your face. A flame thrown in your face. Yeah. No, it's true. Um. I feel like this has been very cathartic. Cathartic, yeah, I think so too. BC. We are at Lipo Lounge in Chinatown. And, you know, we're a few drinks in. Don't hate us. Lipo Lounge? (laughs) Lipo. I said it correctly this time. She's, she calls it. Lipo. I need a little lipo, That's but a we're at lipo. Word, I know. Uh, slip of the tongue, if you will. Maybe. I don't know. Is it slip of the thigh? lipo? No, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're continuing our boarding crawl. We ended up in North Beach again. We went to the festival for a little bit. And then we slipped into Lipo Lounge and met Connie, also known as Consuela. Yeah, she's an OG bartender. She will make the best uh, Mai Tai of your life. And I will say I'm not a Mai Tai person. I like my drinks straight up. Uh, Maybe I'll put them on rocks, but I don't like mixed drinks. But I'm a total Mai Tai Mai person. The Mai Tai at uh, Lipo Lounge is five ingredients, four of which are alcoholic. (laughs) <laughs> there is uh, your light rum, your dark rum, your Bacardi 151, your Chinese liqueur. Whatever that is. I, Never heard I of it my entire like life. I think it's like unicorn jizz. That's what I think it is. She calls it unicorn and, juice. And uh, the fifth ingredient is pineapple juice. And here's Connie. Connie! Connie, can we talk to you for a second? Mama, you're not that busy. Here, let me let me, let me me try to hustle her over. And uh, I would love to talk to her for a second. And just trying to get Connie, the bartender. Can I ask you one question? Um, do you remember Anthony? Bo- were you here when Anthony Bourdain was here? No, I'm not here. 2012. Oh, yes. oh my God! Okay, okay. <laughs> she just wait, no. <laughs> I'm not here. 2012. Okay, oh, 2012. Well, tell us the secret to the best mai tai in the world. Just put the one finger or two finger. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn! Thank you, Connie. Um, so hey, anyways, how you doing? How's your day, Ben? What you been up to today? I've had a few mai tais. I've been in the studio all day, and I just had my first mai tai for the day. I've, I've, had, had, a you. I've had a few mai tais. Thank the you best is that Ann just had a banana and salad today. <laughs> That's why she's looking forward to Sam's, which we're going to next. Yeah, um, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, in terms of Bourdain, he came here during the layover in 2012. And he said, uh, places like Lipo just wouldn't exist without a large buffer zone on all <laughs> sides. He was talking about there's a huge bar that uh, basically carries, carries or a huge bar. Yeah, a padded bar that oh, carries, right, right, yeah, yeah. that lines the place. And then he said, I'm really glad I don't live in San Francisco because I'd be here every fucking night drinking and doing this, which is playing Liar's Dice, which oh. is also what they do at Buddha Bar, which right, is right across right. the street. Is it the so, same owner, um, do you know? I don't know. I don't know about the Feels owners. Feels similar uh, in a way. That's why I was telling you, like, this is the same vibe. Both bars have the same vibe. Although, at least Buddha Lounge, they have a jukebox you can play. Here, they don't have one, which is really ruining my vibe. So, you know I like to play the 80s hits and the current hits. I do, yeah. yeah. R&B. Or sexual healing. Like, a, like, but, a list, like I mentioned in the first uh, Bourdain Crawl episode, in the last episode, being here brings back so yeah, many you, memories. You've been here. <laughs> you've I've, been here. I like. Oh yeah. Did you share the fire story on mic? I don't think. Yes, so. Yes, I did. Oh, you did. Okay. I did. I. I uh, yeah, I was trying to. I was, fire actually, I need to find that, find that picture. Uh, no, but while, I, while we're talking, but yeah, you guys. Uh, there's so much. There's there's so much history here, and if you. Like it's almost like if you haven't done like a bar crawl or you if you haven't gone to the dive bars down Grand Street. Right. 
in, into North Beach. Into yeah. North Beach. Like, if you haven't gone to Buddha, if you haven't gone to Lipo, if you oh, haven't gone Bao to Bao Bao. Bao Bao. Bao Bao is my spot, even though it's uh, not a Bourdain Mama spot. Candy. But that's, like, my, like, I've taken so many people there that it's, like, it's one of those, there's there's a bar that, there's a dive bar that I you guys, that, that we've, that I don't we've want done anyone ep- to know about it. That we've done episodes from yes. that we don't want anybody to know about. Right. But that's, don't go there. That's the Bao Bao well, for that, me. That's oh. an interesting point to bring up, Shar, because uh, I think Bourdain grappled with that, too, because he would give shout outs to these small hole in the walls or beautiful local spots, and then they would get blown up after he would give them a shout out. Right. And uh, it, it's hard between giving a place love yes. and not, not wanting them to change and not shitting them up because I- of. Uh, the the highlight. I do want to um, say when you walk into Lipo Lounge, there is a pretty sizable photo of Bourdain when he was here with one of the owners or bartenders. And then I just <laughs> I had to pee, you guys. I had to use the ladies' restroom. Duh. And I shut the door and I was sitting there looking at the door because, you know, people decorate and shit, especially in bars like this. And there was an R.I.P. A.B. with little hearts next to it. So he really, he's left a mark on society whether he knew it or not and I I'm really happy that we're doing this and I have to thank you guys for coming along on these random texts of trips of like we're gonna do this on a Friday <laughs> and we need a camera yeah, crew you guys, you, and I'm getting interviews yeah. you so guys, thank you well yeah. you know me coming into San Francisco on a Friday I know I, it's uh, terrible I trooped out on a Friday because I, I didn't want to miss it thank you and it's North Beach Festival. It's not yeah, easy it's not to a get good. Here. It's not like the it's easiest not easy weekend to commute here. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but we made it work, and yeah. uh, it's, it's been really fun. Yeah. I can't wait for our next destination. Me too. Thanks, Anthony and Bourdain. Uh, we will see you at Sam's. We salute you, sir. I can't wait to eat a burger. Can't wait. Duh. I am kind of hungry. We are at the. World famous Sam's Burgers, still in North Beach. This is the uh, second half of our crawl. I'm full. I'm really full. Are you full? Why do you have to leave North Beach? You get everything you need right here, (laughs) Mama. Okay. Captain Party is Captain Party is Captain Party here. Well, at Lipo, we were waiting for producer (laughs) Shar, so I had to drink extra mai tais to fill my time. I should have taken a picture of that. Of all the all the mai all the mai tais. We could Still, we could have faked it till we made it, but um, uh, there were lots of ours. So, this place is awesome. <laughs> I'd never been here before. This was my first time, and it's not going to be my last. It's a and good. It's a good place if you're if you need you sustenance. Need to pick me up. Yeah, it's you know it's like without like you know like when everybody needs that thing that hits the spot like Sam. It's probably why it does so well because it's right at the end of North Beach, yep. right at the end of Chinatown. Yep. It's and right there, it's right at the end of everything. Exactly. <laughs> of your well, whole I mean, night. It's on the other side of the tunnel over in uh, Russian Hill. <laughs> well, and it's simple. It's a simple burger, but it's juicy. It's it's just not doing too much. It's, it's just everything you need. Well, I took a couple of pictures of the, I Well, I actually did take a picture of the before. And I guess I should. Good for you, because I was like. Rawr, 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 rawr. No, and then, I I and then I took a picture of an after. We <laughs> inhaled that sucker. It was delicious. But I think it's well, it's very different than Red's. Red's is like on a sourdough roll. Uh, it just has mustard, if you want cheese, cheese, and onions. And oh, pickles. And pickles. That's it. There's no lettuce. There's no tomato. They don't add that. And you can't ask for it. This was like mayonnaise. Ketchup, mustard, lettuce, tomatoes, yeah, it's like delicious. Broiled and yeah, yeah, it's just on a whole other level. And it's made to order, like right. We, he, you watch the chef watch. It. Exactly. I'm sorry, you watch the chef make your food. Sorry, I had a few drinks this afternoon. It's very Bourdain esque. What do well, you want from and, me? Well, and Bourdain when he came here, he called Sam his walking Buddha. He said he was his patron saint, and he said, uh, "I never thought a hamburger could be good at a place that also serves pizza." I'm in, <laughs> I'm in love. Oh. So uh, those were his thoughts on the place, and they now have coined the Bourdain Special, which, what yeah. is it, Aaron? It's a double cheeseburger, fries, and a beer for seventeen ninety nine, which Whoa. is very cheap in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's like a, budget shop. Yeah, that's a cheap meal, y'all. Yeah, it's normally, freeze. Sometimes you pay $17 just for the drink. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or when you go to a baseball game. <laughs> and yeah. the fries are bomb. And another thing that I love about this place oh. is they just have ranch. 
like for a your big pleasure. Ranch and you for sat your right in front ranch. of the ranch oh, bottle. That's so rare. That should be our new company is Ranch for Your Pleasure. Or maybe the <laughs> title of our autobiography, Ranch. One or two fingers. Ranch for His Pleasure. <laughs> okay. Harkening back to Lipo <laughs> Lounge. Two fingers. I don't know what she was talking about. <laughs> I know what I was talking about. <laughs> Not you. I know. Connie, who introduced herself as Consuela. Anyways. This has been a great day again, and we're going to continue on. I think we're going to do, <sighs> after Ange yawns Sorry. into the <laughs> mic. Um. I think we need to keep channeling Bourdain because uh, it's quite magical. It is. Things that we Things happen. Upon. People just attend our crawl, and we get good stories, or we just catch up with folks. Um, so this has been good. This, this is the one thing I've been writing a blog and I'm hoping I can get it out by next week about Bourdain and him passing but I'm learning that he's just bringing people together community yep and that's I think that's what's and it still is very special about him All right, we've been to Lipo, Sam's, now we're at Tornado, which I have never really been to. Which is really just so crazy to me, all but you're not places, a beer drinker, so. I'm not a beer drinker, but also all of these places I really have never been to on this part of the crawl. That is fucking crazy. But the cool, you're right, you hadn't been to Sam's, and okay, well, uh, the thing is I used to live in Lower Haight uh, in my college years, and um, Mad Dog in the Fog right across the street used to have free barbecue on um, I think it was Saturday nights I don't remember anymore but I survived by that so that's why like I would come to Tornado's but then I would go to Mad Dog for my free barbecue because nice. it was balling on a budget but yeah Heck. this place is a, a staple for any beer lover uh, do, do you remember when we went to Bear Bottle yes we recorded from Bear Bottle yeah, and the owner there one of the co-owners said that once he got his beer at Tornado's he yes, knew he'd made he it he knew he made it that's <laughs> right I forgot thank yeah, you for like remembering for, that uh, for any Real beer lover, you have to come to this place. You have to check it out. They have rotating taps. Uh, and apparently, if you follow them on Instagram, every day at about noon, they'll take a picture oh, of their wall of drought beers so you can see what they have to offer because every day it drought changes. Drought beers or draft? Oh, draft. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, look, it says drought. We can't hear you. This is Jeff Hunt of uh, Story San Francisco fame. It's actually on Twitter, not as you Okay, but sorry, Twitter. The, but the, I'd say the menu itself is iconic. Yeah. And that's what, that's what they put up. It's just no words, just a picture of the menu. Yeah. And it's like, this is today at Tornado. Well, in the fucking, it says drought beers. It's still draft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're All right. right. God damn it. We I've had you. a few. Yeah, she's only had, <laughs> this is only your second, isn't it? Yeah, but they're a little bit strong. Yeah. Is there, uh, uh, so he's Bord- got some... Uh, Bourdain came here at least um, for his show, uh, The Layover, in 2012. And what he had to say was, let's see, he said, daytime drinking is a tradition here. We're here during the day. As it is in any <laughs> great city. He goes on to note about Tornado. The Tornado Bar is a good place for me to start my day. It's known mostly for beer, of which they stock 50-plus microbrews, microbrews, and about 100 bottled beers. And most importantly, they boast a no Grateful Dead policy on the jukebox. <laughs> yeah. Well, he continues, he continues, which ensures me the peace of mind and spirit I need for a late morning buzz. <laughs> so you don't, you don't have to deal with that shit. And in San Francisco, it's, you it's never hard. know, really. Right. Well, true San Francisco establishments. Maybe right. not the new ones. They're not as uh, dead heady as the uh, OG ones. No, they're not. <laughs> but um, it's funny, one of the bartenders that was on that episode is here today. But he won't come on mic, which is fine. But it's nice to know there's sort of a part of Bourdain here. Yeah, I mean, who knows how long he's been working here? Uh, Well, at least 20 20 years, at least. Yeah. Okay, well. Since he was 60, he's now 80, (laughs) 90. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We should all be so lucky to look that good at 80. Hell yeah, long flowing hair. Yeah. 
No, but uh, I, yeah, this is definitely an establishment for any beer drinkers. And uh, yeah, it feels good. It feels good in here. I haven't been here in years and years and years, but it still feels the same as it did in the early 2000s when I lived down the street. So, well, it's my again, it's my first time. So, well, right. And if you, when you come to Tornado, just know you can go next door to Rosamund Sausage Grill and pick <laughs> a sausage, and you can bring it back to the bar, which is awesome. It's the perfect marriage. Yeah, this is definitely a Bourdain bar. I mean, when you come in here, it's. It's a little dirty. It smells. It smells. It's, it's a lot of history in here. Um, so that's People why we are just breathing beer in here. This is what it smells like. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. That's the oxygen. It's beer. Yeah. <laughs> it's beer burps. Uh, Jeff Hunt from Story San Francisco, do you have anything to add to this about Tornado? Because you, you are here often. Nothing specifically about... Bourdain. I wasn't here when he was here. Um, but yeah, this place is a good... I, and I, I think the owners would agree that this is a good place to kind of get to know beer. They have a, they do a good job and they have since before beer was trendy about finding small craft beers of any type. It's not just the IPA f- you know, phenomenon. Um, they have the menu with... What is it? What is it? Bourdain said more than 50 and it's beers of all varieties from and not just from Northern California or the Bay Area they're you know they go out of state they just they just do a really they, they love beer and it shows and and they've been doing it since before beer was true uh, that's exactly what I was gonna say like you come and get a really good craft beer local craft beer before it was but craft beer it's not right. but it's not uppity it's no. still like grimy so I don't even drink beer, but I found two that I could drink here, so. And I, this is also very Bourdain, because it's very salty here. I like it. Salty? <laughs> it's a salty kind of place. Yeah. yeah. No bullshit. Anthony Bourdain stops many years ago during no, no reservations. reservations and uh, I don't really know when I found this bar but once I did I knew it was really special and I didn't want to tell anyone about it <laughs> so I don't I don't know that I could compare it to any other bar in the city uh, both in style and history atmosphere and history and location and everything about it is just a little odd and yes. perfect at yes. the same time <laughs> like odd and appropriate at the same time just like Anthony Bourdain <laughs> <laughs> and us to be honest and us yeah and us um yeah uh it's weird because we're recording on July 6th though it's almost been a month since he's passed which feels weird um but we're still honoring him. We're still doing our hashtag Bourdain Crawl. And um, I, I really, I hold this bar very near and dear to my heart. Um, if you, when you come to San Francisco, as you're listening to this podcast, you got to come here. Just put it on the list. Doesn't even have to be a whole Bourdain thing. It just, it's, it's very old San Francisco. And I love it. Well, and uh, what, what he had to say about it was uh, run by a legendary, unfriendly owner. Which I love already. <laughs> I'm in, yes. Uh, the notorious guardian of another age, Bruno. He was famous for running things his way and only his way. Bruno's gone, died in 2000, but he's not forgotten. Uh, and we're going to talk shortly with uh, the bartender of this place, Kundan, who's amazing and hilarious. You guys are going to love her. But uh, she has great stories about Bruno and his successor, who is uh, Mr. Clark, I believe. Bob Clark. Bob Clark. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk to her shortly. Yeah. But until then, I also want to mention that this is still one of the remaining bars in the city that has a regular jukebox. Right. Not It is computer. not one of those fucking bullshit internet jukeboxes right, right. where anybody could just come in and play Taylor Swift or whatever your fucking bullshit is. <laughs> this is actually one of those bars you come to because their jukebox is an expression of this bar. Right. It's not just whatever the fuck some asshole wants to come in and play. And I have to say, it's a jukebox that Bish Talk approves. 
Yes. Like every CD that's in there, I was like, yeah, yep. yep. And we're going to have uh, the up and coming, we're going to yes. have episodes where we travel to the last of these bars that have regular jukeboxes and we're going to give you our top 10 playlist from that jukebox and appreciate them for maintaining that bit of history. Right. So that's exciting. It's going to be a new... A new uh, little ep- a little uh, segment. Yeah. For Bitch Talk. Yeah. One other thing I want to mention before we talk to our friend, our new friend, the bartender, Kun- Kundin? Kun- Kundan? Kundan. Kundan. Here she is. Yes. <laughs> Here she is. Welcome to the show. Let me grab, uh, you can take my mic. Thank you. So, if you will, again, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Ob Sam Sam? So the bar was opened in 1941 by two brothers, Sam and Malik Mouche. Uh, they left Baghdad in 21. They were Assyrian, so it was a very small ethnic group um, from the greater Mesopotamia area. When they moved out here, uh, Sam and his wife ran a little luncheonette counter down the street. Their son Bruno um, would come to the luncheonette after school and go clean up the lun- uh, clean up and swipe uh, sweep up the floors and. He learned, you know, the, the hard work that you put into owning a business. And when his father opened this bar, his father and his uncle bought the building in 1941 and opened this bar, he really, he worked alongside with his dad until he served in World War II, because um, we opened 11 days after Pearl Harbor. So <laughs> San Francisco's... Timing. Yeah. San Francisco <laughs> was suddenly just teeming with, with sailors. Um, right. And drinkers. And drinkers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they, they really... Where was I then? <laughs> You, it was a, you were here, but it was a different you. Anyway, I'm sure. Became gay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Gay old San Francisco. But yeah, the neighborhood was just a lot of like working class families. Uh, a lot of San Francisco was, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. And so when Bruno's dad opened the bar, he wanted a nice like upscale cocktail lounge where people could go, and he wanted it to be a throwback to his, his motherland. So they found an architect, uh, John O'Shana, who also was an, like, an artist, and he liked to do lobbies and bars and incorporate a huge mural, which is why we have this epic Right behind you, us. yes. It's Still beautiful. original. It's only been clean, never been touched up. The new owner who took it over from Bruno when he passed in 2000, because Bruno didn't have any children to Wait, pass it on to. This has never been touched up? It's no, still It's only been cleaned. It's beautiful. I'm There's sorry. been no okay. paint added to it. Okay. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Um, no, everyone that's listening, when you come here and you see, well, I already put up a picture on Instagram, but when you come in here and see, it looks like someone just painted it. Anyways, it's, 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 it's beautiful. Remarkable. And it's so indelible when people know Zam Zam. We had like a short 30 second clip in a Woody Allen movie, Blue Jasmine. Oh, yeah. And it literally is like a quick pan across the, the, mural, the mural and then a focus on the, the two characters sitting and having a drink. And there's almost no dialogue. As like I said, it lasts maybe 30 seconds. But I had women come in and say, I just saw the movie. I live on the other side of town. I haven't been here in 20 years and I had to come in. Yeah. I'm, I've had people come in in tears. I'm so happy you guys are still here. Yeah. It's, it's a big part of the history of hate street yeah so like i said when bruno right. took it over yes. from his dad he really stuck to his dad's old rules and like i said the bar opened in the 40s and his father was very um wary of young women that came in to drink by themselves because back then it was usually ladies of the night so there was like an unspoken house rule that women couldn't come in and drink by themselves <gasps> and, okay yeah well what about ladies of the day which we are right now <laughs> which is right now <laughs> Yeah. If, if you come in, in in twos or threes, then you're fine. It was just it was the solo women that he always had to look out for. Our entrance to our basement used to be a phone booth, but Sam Bruno's father caught a sailor and a young lady in there, up to some shenanigans, and ripped it out. Oh, oh <laughs> so like said, they this were old thing school. right they here. Were, yeah, they were immigrants, and so they they had this very old school mentality. And they also, like I said, the great thing about Bruno growing up on the street and working in his dad's luncheonette, his parents' luncheonette, was that he knew the like what hard work meant and how you could reap the rewards and so he really ran his dad's business with that same motto and so when hippies came in asking for like free acid he was like get off my lawn slash get out of my bar <laughs> I, I love that eternal struggle to keep this place classy on hate street like in the heart of just free love free drugs so if you think free love was rough the years that came after that were really rough because there was a bad heroin epidemic on this street it was a rough neighborhood and it was probably really hard for Bruno to to witness like I said when he was a kid growing up here it's a completely different world Um, but you know he stayed the course and in the 90s in particular like you just didn't know when the bar was going to be open he didn't have to worry about making money off the bar because his parents had you know grandfathered the bar down to him and his brother 
um, and so he just opened when he wanted to, and he would kick you out if he didn't like the way you looked or the drink you ordered, and he didn't he didn't have to worry about it. So when Bob took over the bar, he obviously wanted the staff to be a little bit friendlier and and all that <laughs> stuff. But you know, we still want to maintain the integrity of the bar and the history of it, and that was Bruno's dying wish was to make sure that the Zam Zam stayed, stayed alive and the, the, the legacy continued. Well, that's what Bourdain really pays a tribute to when he talks about Zam Zam is the legendarily unfriendly owner, but for a reason and his spirit is still alive. And that's kind of what made this place special and what sets it apart from every other place on Hate Street. And there's, I mean, as much as we are still a modern bar, obviously, you, know, you change with the times, um, there's a level of decorum that just... You know, you got to be an adult to drink here. Not just over 21. Like, you got to act like an adult. If, Little manners. If you're a smart ass, and I, I just, I won't take it. Uh, uh, most of my staff, my coworkers, none of the staff here wants to, wants to deal with your smart ass. Like, if you want to go drink PBRs in the park, that's cool. I won't, like, knock anybody that comes in here and wants a beer and a shot. But just be an adult about it, you know? Right. We love making a good cocktail, but we just want to make sure the customers are happy and everyone's playing nice it's a great bar there's no televisions it's a curved bar so you yes. actually are encouraged to talk to each other um, the jukebox we try and make sure there's nothing from this century or even touching the century because uh, we, we want love it, to be it really by the classic. way we love it um, appreciate it yeah we the staff here we all try and kind of put our two cents we have a everyone has a favorite on there and that somebody had a you know request for but um, yeah we try and keep it a really classic eclectic but still classic what does the history of this bar mean to you like you've been here for six years but a patron for 11 like it must really hold a huge place in your heart to be here and yeah, want to be here there's a huge sense of community I think what is overlooked in the hate because it is such a tourist destination is that there still is that community and I think that's what Bruno clung to um, and appreciated when I mean he had his friends he had his group of people that could come in and they knew the rules and uh, they were friends Bruno liked to go out to dinner with some of his patrons um, and honestly like half the patrons that come in here half my regulars are friends of mine I I go to their kids' graduations or... Oh, you make them, them what? Well, you used to make them onesies. Yes, I, 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 <laughs> you I told took us. it upon myself to make onesies yeah. for a few of the babies that yeah. were born to, to Zam Zam couples. We've had a wedding reception here for a regular, and it was great because... Oh, yeah. She, we, didn't, we, didn't, we never close to the public. So even if you want to have an event here, we never close the doors. It's never a private party. It's always going like to be that. open. Yeah. And that was something that Bob really always wanted to keep, uh, to maintain. He never wanted the, the neighborhood folk to feel like they couldn't come into their spot. Because on a given weekday, it seriously is. It's the neighborhood community checking in on each other. And how was your trip? And how's your kid? And how's work? And just... There's, there's a lot of that, and I think that's what's overlooked, and I think that's what's lovely about Zams, is there, as much as there are communities at every other bar, there's an overlapping sense of family and community in this neighborhood. I, I do feel like, also given the location where there could be crazy, crazy shit happening all the time, you really need that sense of community to really... Uh, maintain and survive in this neighborhood. Can you can you talk about some of the crazy stories that the, of like customers that you've had in here? You've already shared some of them with us. They're incredible. There's there's funny crazy stuff like when a guy probably tripping on acid came in dressed like a kangaroo. I, in all honesty, just tried to meet him at his level and say, sorry, we don't serve kangaroos, and he politely walked out. So, you know, weird stuff like that happens. But, you know, it is still a bar, and it is still Hate Street, and there is always an element of, you know, diciness out there. Um, I did once have a homeless man try and punch me. Well, he did punch me. Uh, but before I could even cock back and swing, there was another regular from the neighborhood that had him by the back of the collar and was dragging him out. Nice. Like, that's, that's another really nice thing about knowing that even when you're working by yourself, there's people in the bar that you know respect and love the bar so much and respect and love you so much that they won't let anything bad happen. So like I said, that sense of community really, it gives you a stronger backbone. It gets, lets you stand up a little taller mm. knowing that there's, there's always somebody in your corner. Or if it's just a stressful day and somebody is being an idiot and you're trying not to turn on your inner Bruno. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just having someone where you can just glance at them and be like, oh my God, I want to kill them. Or myself. But yeah. That should be another t-shirt up there. My inner Bruno or yes. something. Channeling. So don't make me channel my inner Bruno. Right, yeah, something. Yeah. I, I have or a little pin people. or something <laughs> that just says that. 
really funny. That was Beta Breakers. Beta Breakers is always a crapshoot, and there's two people working because it's it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, and there was one year when uh, about a dozen people dressed up as giant hot dogs were trying to sneak beers <laughs> out, and it's the. <laughs> In, in their they buns, were sticking their beer in the bun. Don't talk about my buns that way. <laughs> or what you stick in there? <laughs> you can stick a little more than beer. Hey, okay, so. all right. Anyway, <laughs> that's why it's called bitch talk. Yeah. Anyway, uh, go ahead. But yeah, it was uh, my coworker had to yell like things you'd never expect to come out of your mouth. Much like sorry, we don't serve kangaroos. Was if one more hot dog tries to sneak out beers. We're 86ing all the hot dogs. And it was like a very angry, it wasn't set calmly like that. It was a screaming at the top of your lungs because you're just at wit's end with how stupid people can be on a sunny day when they're allowed to drink. In a public. lot of drinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, quickly, so, you know, we approached you as we have in every place we've been to. And like, is it okay if we record here? And we mentioned Anthony Bourdain and you brought out a book, but I didn't hear what the story was in terms of what that book is and who brought it and who's signing it so, and if you don't um, mind sharing you know Anthony Bourdain came to, to Zams nine years ago uh, and some of the patrons that were in that video are still patrons to this day uh, the owner Bob was the bartender then he does not bartend but he still owns the bar uh, and he got to understand and really love the history you know Bruno obviously I'm sure Anthony Bourdain has a lot of over had a lot of overlap with his his cantankerous side, but there was also a really sweet side to Bruno, and again, that love of his family um, and and the legacy that they, they gave him. And so, on the day that uh, Bourdain passed away, I was working. It was a oh. definite struggle to keep buttoned up when right. there was just so much coursing through you viscerally um, when hearing that news. I think a lot of people that um, worked in food and beverage understood that when if you've read Kitchen Confidential you understand he spoke like you spoke he could take phrases out of your own brain and put them on paper and you thought nobody else felt like that until you read his his writing Um, because he spoke from the heart he was a really honest character and a lot of people that came in that day were just um, not making a big deal out of it there was a lot of people that came in and just sort of um, you know, ordered their martinis and quietly to their friend just cheered, you know, to Bourdain, to the chef. Um, and one of our regulars brought in her copy of Kitchen Confidential and just asked if anybody wanted to write a note about their their takeaway from Bourdain, their um, their love of him and his, uh, his approach to life, not just food. Uh, so it was, it was just a nice way to have everybody sort of write down a little sentiment and so we're just keeping it behind the bar and it's nice for people to be able to flip through and and read and see and understand anybody listening to this who wants to come into zamzam what how do you describe it what what can they expect coming into this place and why why is it so quintessentially san francisco um i i think because you can walk in and start a conversation with a person that you might not know on your day-to-day life in your day-to-day routine um, I've seen a professor talk to a mechanic, and by the end of the night, they were hugging and buying each other shots. Like, <laughs> seriously, made him serious a, a deep connection. Um, and that's again, that's one of the reasons why Zamzam doesn't have televisions. This isn't a place where you just gape into the abyss. You you engage in the the environment. You know, this is a space that you are holding a spot in. So what are you going to do with that spot? Have a cocktail? Yes. Enjoy the music? Maybe play a few songs on the juke? Sure. But converse and get to know your neighbor. And I, I feel sometimes in the changing world of San Francisco, we forget that. Um, and I'm, I'm not a San Francisco native, but people often think I am because I really respect the, um, the connections of, of people and their history and the time they've spent here. And Again, this, you know, just like the nation is built on immigrants, San Francisco is built on people coming from all over. Mm-hmm. Cities are like that. They draw people from from all stretches of the world and the country. So it's, it's wonderful to have people that, like I said, don't necessarily have a surface connection that you can pinpoint, but you just have a couple drinks and the next thing you know, you're going to find something that you're going to be like new best friends with somebody that you meet here. I mean, we connected on Will Clark, so there's that. Yes. <laughs> Go try it. Yes.
We hope you enjoyed the revisit of our 2018 Bourdain Crawl. If you want to go back to those episodes, they are 283 and 294 of the Bitch Talk podcast. And don't forget that the documentary Roadrunner, a film about Anthony Bourdain by director Morgan Neville, is out this Friday, July 16th. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show is edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.